If you're looking for a beautiful place for your next holiday that's truly relaxing and different from well-trodden destinations like Bali, then come to one of Indonesia's finest. This is Gili Gedi, aka Secret Island. We were just about to go over the uh, other side of the island and then we bumped into Joe. Uh, he is our electrician, um, but he's a bit of a jack of all trades actually. He's got his fingers in a few pies here. And we did say to him that uh, we want to hook up with him and go for a little tour around the island and get to meet some of the locals and with his interpretation get a bit of better understanding of what life is like on Gili Gedi. Um, it wasn't supposed to be today, but it just so happens we've bumped into him. So he's uh, suggested that we go into his house for a cup of tea anyway. So uh, let's do that. We're sitting here with Joe, outside Joe's house. And you use this here rather than the house for socialising. This is a baruga. In Sasak, a language we call baruga. This place is made for like sociality, which means like a family can come, like a friend, our neighbour, you know, we're always talking and meet on this place. I mean, we have a living area also on our house, but we really like on the outside like this one. You should be outside, don't you? Yeah. Because you've got great weather here. And it's After tea at yeah. Joe's, we went for a wander with him to get a better understanding of this little bit of paradise. It's one of the islands which form the lesser known secret gillies. Gili, by the way, is the Sasak word for island. In fact, we went for many wanders across Gili Gedi while we were there, and this episode captures a few of them. We learned about the local Sasak language, visited some resorts, and began to understand the local people's desire to strike a balance between protecting their culture and encouraging tourism. So we're going to look at some fishing activity. We've seen loads of fishing boats, we've uh -huh. seen loads of fishermen, we've seen fish being cooked on the beach. Uh -huh. Our people doing a fishermen because you know that island, not much people doing another work, another yeah. job. You know. Sometimes when you know investors come doing like a building, which means construction, you know, they just move into another job, which means doing like a handyman. Carpenter, yes. like me, an electrician, but on this season, on this year, it's quite hard, you know. Of course, so no much, you know, people come to investment and then build some like a house or hotel. Indonesia hasn't even been open for one year yet yep. since COVID, so we're still, it's still very early. Uh -huh. So it had a big effect on the country, didn't it? Like everywhere in the yep. whole world. Whole world. Lots of people lost their incomes, job, and anything. Yes. But sometimes the price of the fish is getting down. It's yes. because, you know, the COVID, no one's going to be like spend a lot of money for food, you know. But at least here you can fish and you can eat because yeah. you have fish. That's like a different than like an, we live on city. City, we always paying everything, yeah. you know. Yeah. In Same. this island, we just come to the sea, catch the fish and then we can eat, you know. So when things were really, really bad, at least here, you could eat because you could get fish. When the big, big, big storm comes, uh, this is coming on the, like an, a December. This is going to be like a big, big wind and then storm coming. That's like a, we do a stop everything. Even a bootman, a transport station is stuck. You know, fishermen can't catch a fish. You yes. know, everything is going to be like hard. You know, a price is going to be high. Mm. It's because there is no transport. We're very interested in the boats. They're using for catch a small fish uh, without a net. They just like uh, using like a rod, fishing, fishing rod, and then something like um, what we call string. That's what we can't use that for catching uh, like we call tongkol fish in the middle of the ocean. It's because too dangerous and then too small. The other one, they have us... The sail. Uh, the sail, right, and then with the big engine. So the ones with the sail and then the engines, they go out a lot further. They yep. go out deeper and further. Yeah, that's why they're designing with the, a sail. Yeah. Sometimes they're not using engine yeah. doing a sailing, you know. Sometimes the problem is the wind, you know. Yeah. Something 
when it's calm, sometimes it just disappears. Oh, out, that's why we know all about wind on our <laughs> <Yeah>. sailing. <laughs> We continued along the beach and came across boatmen salvaging a transport boat used to carry construction materials to the island. Joe explained that the fishing boats we see are mainly produced on Bali, but the transportation boats are made locally on Gili Gedi. This is important as there are no ferry services running to the island and transport boats play an important role in the island's economy and ability to thrive. As cruisers in Indonesia, we see more fishing boats than any other type of vessel. But one thing we hadn't noticed were the differences in style and painting of these boats. The different area is going to be like a different style, you know. Okay, so if you you were put down somewhere and you didn't know where you were, you could look at the boat yeah. and you would know yeah. where you were. And what about the colours? Are the colours significant or no? Yeah, the colour is from the government. They sh you should be put the really, really bright colour on the night. Okay, yeah. So you can see like a white and then the, the blue one. That's why the... So that's why they're white. Nearly all of them are this bright white. So you yeah. see them at night. You see, you can see that on the night. Yes. Yes. It's good because it's not like that in every country. Um, I've really noticed it since we got here. I don't think that in Sulawesi they were white. And they didn't always well, have the outriggers. That's why I say it's a different area. It's going to be like a yeah. different style. Yeah. Hello. Hello. So that was Misa and her friends. And in fact, they're not from the island. They are from Mataram, which is the capital town, capital city of Lombok and they're just over for uh, the weekend or for the day but did you see how many fish they had on that barbecue? There were probably 10 of them, uh, of the students, but uh, there were probably about 50 fish. But you can see as we walk all the way up that uh, maybe it's because it's a Saturday but every single house that we see, we've got two here on the beach, they're all burning coconut husks, which is something that, of course, we saw in Sulawesi, and that is how they barbecue their freshly caught fish. This is for all the family? No, no. this is just for friends. My friends. All of this? We just for you? University group. Great. Oh, oh. They're all sitting around a little barbecue with ikan, which is fish. But uh, ikan is, of course, Bahasa, that's uh, Indonesian language. But a lot of people here speak Sasak as well, which is quite a different language. So the common language is Bahasa, but uh, Sasak is what these people here speak. It's completely different, and I've tried to learn a few words and I've forgotten them already, but uh, Liz is going to have a go. So we have different Sasak. So Sasak is... Uh, is many. Luas. It has many. many different languages like that. In Bahasa, <laughs> how do you say please? In Bahasa is a tolong, we and call tolong, and, and, and in Sasak is sila. So quite sila. different. It's quite different, yeah. yeah. I think one of the things we're going to discuss about Gili Gedi is how this is really just a kind of little secret because uh, the tourists, they will go to Bali, some venture as far as Lombok, but they don't get as far as Gili Gedi and uh, there are a few little treats in store on this island. It's very, very rustic, but there are a couple of nice resorts as well. And that's why I've just picked up the camera just to show you. You can see behind me, uh, this is Kokomo. This is one of two uh, rather more salubrious uh, places to stay. So if you did fancy getting away from it all, getting away from all the tourists on Bali and even Lombok, get yourself down here. And if you fancy a bit of um, luxury, why not stay here at Kokomo? Well, as we continued back down the east coast, we thought we'd just uh, head towards a place called Tamarind. Uh, but what we didn't realize was that there are two other little resorts next to Tamarind. One is the high dive little resort which is a uh, dive school, but also a restaurant as well. And we've just eaten and the food is really good. I had a tempeh burger. Uh, so if you do find yourself down this way, definitely come down this section. There's a lagoon that divides this and the rest of the islands. You have to sort of walk down the beach. And here you have three resorts. This one, 
We've got uh, high dive just in front of me here and then tamarind just there. So this is a resort that's owned by a Dutch person yeah. but has been closed throughout COVID so and every everyone means working on there, they lost a job. Oh. It's like now, it's like an abandoned place. Abandoned, yes. Yeah. What a shame, it looks really lovely. What a great spot. I don't know how, why what the reason why the owner is not running in the business again. Well it's still early. They still may come back the season when the season comes back. Yeah. So these roofs, these are based on a traditional yeah, traditional roof uh, house in Sasak Sasak culture. We call it like a lumbung. Right. Lumbung lumbung means like a traditional house on of the Sasak to keep it a food means like a beans rice inside yeah. the like a compartment. Yes. Okay. Let's have a look. And the roof is made from grass. This is we call alang alang. Alang alang means like a grass, a big, yeah. big grass. Okay, we saw some of this growing yeah. on Lombok, didn't we? This is sadly another victim of COVID. We've commented on this many times now over the last year or so, as we continue to see evidence of businesses that have collapsed sadly due to the pandemic and this is just another example uh, this is quite an extreme example though because it is absolutely stunning this place it is well thought out sold as an eco lodge and by the way when i say sold as an eco lodge it is for sale so if anyone is interested in investing in this location on the end of gilly Gedi, the secret island then uh, here's the for sale sign before tourism hit Gili Gedi, and much of Indonesia for that matter, the main activity was fishing. Life was quiet, self-sufficient and shaped by the climate and seasons. Of course, tourism changed that and created job opportunities for local communities. Joe explained that the trickle of tourists into Gili Gedi makes them happy. If some hotels building into the, in this island, we can also like working, selling something into the tourists, you know, like and doing like a uh, ocean activity, like snorkeling, diving, you know, but you know that the people here before she doesn't understand, really, really understand about the like and tourism business. It took some persuading because tourism was new to the people of Gili Gedi. The concept of profit went against local culture and so they banned any development on the island. Eventually, they learned that they'd have new job opportunities and that the infrastructure would improve. This would benefit both the island's small population and its visiting tourists. And then now, everyone's coming from another country. We are really happy. You have Get more opportunities to yeah, do different things and to make some more money. Yeah, sure. Not just fishing. Not yeah. Just fishing. Do you think there's a danger that it will become too no. touristy? No, really, it's like no... Like Bali? No. We keep this island like uh, a virgin. Means like not really much entertain, entertain business on this island because it's going to be like destroy, destroy our culture, you know? We want like an, keep our culture, yes. keep our tradition, and then which means a people can see, a tourist can see or learning from yes. us, you know? Yes, yes, we understand. So that's great. So. Bring on the tourists, but let them come and, yeah. and, and understand and get to know Gili Gedi yeah, and how you guys Gilligedi. live and work. It's not all good news for Gili Gedi though. Over on the northwest side of the island lies a natural lagoon that in the past was inhabited by all kinds of wildlife, from fish and reptiles to a variety of exotic birds and untold insect species. Sadly, it was sold to investors who cut up the hillside to reclaim the land Perhaps if this had been managed properly, it would have provided a new source of income to the local residents, but instead, the project was abandoned. Right, so from what I understand, somebody came along, started some construction work, mm -hmm. did some land refill. This is as far as they've got. You've got the ocean throwing in water when the weather is bad, yeah. 
And so now you've lost the natural lagoon lake that was here, and you've yeah. now got this. In terms of tourism, the people of Gilligedi are frustrated. They feel they're being left out as they watch other areas on Lombok receive government support. Regions like Kuta, which are seeing an explosion of funding supported by the government, which is billing it as the new Bali. Conversely, almost all development on Gili Gedi is financed by private individuals, often spearheaded by foreigners who partner with locals, including Marina del Rey on the south of the island, the cosy Tanjungan Bucket Lodge in the southeast, and places like High Dive. All offer great accommodation on a small scale, excellent food at reasonable prices, and all create job opportunities for the local community. And yet there is still no ferry service to and from the island, no refuse collection, and in 2023, still no running water, which has to be shipped in by boat. Gili Gedi doesn't want to go the way of the Gillies in the north of Lombok, or the supercharged development in Kuta, but it would like to find a balance between tourism and the preservation of its local culture. The flip side to this conundrum is that at present, the peace and tranquility of the island is its charm, a relatively unspoilt and fascinating place to visit as a foreigner. We start with the shell. Anything to do with fishing keeps me amused, so we were thrilled when we wandered into the next village with Joe and found Unus in the middle of constructing an octopus lure. Uh, octopus like is in the, the like a black one. So in, then, in English we call this tiger cowry. Tiger cowry. In English. The magnificent Cypriot tigris, that's tiger cowry to you and me, is plentiful in the reefs around this area. I've found fragments washed up on the beach, but never specimens as beautiful as those used by the fishermen. Tiger cowrie shells come in different colours and patterns, but the fishermen, after generations of testing, have worked out that octopus much prefer the darker varieties best of all. Once the best tiger cowrie has been found and cleaned, they make three holes in the shell through which they push stainless steel legs. The next process is to fill the shell, including the hoop, and three rods in it with molten lead. Then the painstaking task of attaching three hooks with flashing lures to each leg begins. Super glue is added to help keep the twine hooks and rods in place. By the end of this fiddly job, I have a solid leg with three evil looking hooks poking out along its shaft. It seems that communities across the Indo Pacific have been catching octopus this weight for millennia. In the Mariana Islands, archaeologists have found ancient relics of this method dating back to 1500 BC. So we've battered these poor guys into selling us one, and I'm very happy to say this is it. I am going to blunt these because they look deadly. And it was Eunice over here, the fisherman, who made it for us. Well, made it for himself, and we've got it now. <laughs> Kids playing in the afternoon sun. The light is now much better. Uh, so we're... We are two-thirds of the way around the island, but we still have quite a bit of way to go all the way around there. So we're going to see if we can get a local boat. This is the last of the three major villages. We're now on the uh, north or the west side, I suppose, of the island. Having just walked through two, I suppose you'd call them private resorts. So the two owners, one German and one Kiwi, uh, live next door to each other and they're doing up these places and although they live there, they actually rent them out as well. They're just absolutely stunning. A lot of time and effort's gone into them. So uh, anyway, I'm going to remove myself from these noisy girls here and uh, go see if we can get a boat back. We spent four hours walking around the island. It's been brilliant, but we're knackered and there's another five kilometers to get us back to the marina. So we're getting a local boat instead. The difference between these gillies and the northern gillies is that these are really unspoiled and they are well known for being far less visited. There are a few little hotels and spots along here but really nobody comes here and they desperately need people to come and enjoy the silence, the quiet, the tranquility of a traditional, very old Indonesian island 
There's a few villages here, mostly fishing, which is what they've done in this area for hundreds of years. But we love Gilly Geddy and the surrounding secret gillies down here in the southwest, and we do think that if you're going to come this way, you should make that extra little bit of an effort to come here rather than the northern gillies.